Sighting. The start of the holiday is traditionally based on sightings of the new moon, which vary according to geographic location. Marketplace Morning Report is next. Spring has sprung, home sales have not. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Palo Alto Networks. Palo Alto Networks delivers what's next in cybersecurity innovation to protect today's digital way of life. Learn more at paloaltonetworks.com. And by Fidelity. A dedicated Fidelity advisor can help create a wealth plan for a full financial picture. Investment minimums apply. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. From Marketplace, I'm Sabri Beneshaw in for David Brancaccio. Home sales usually surge in the spring, but not this year. Sales of existing homes were down in three out of four regions of the U.S. last month. It's according to the National Association of Realtors. Marketplace's Nancy Marshall-Genzer is here live to talk about what's happening in housing. Hi, Nancy. Good morning. So just how much have home sales fallen? The National Association of Realtors says sales of existing homes were down 22% last month from the same time last year, Sabri. The only place where home sales didn't fall was in the Northeast. So sales were down in the Midwest, South, and West. What's behind that? I mean, why are home sales actually falling during what is normally the busiest time of the year? Well, mortgage rates rose last week for the first time in over a month. That certainly didn't help. Uh, Freddie Mac says the average rate for a 30-year mortgage is now 6.39%. And Freddie Mac says the housing market just won't get back to normal until rates drop into the mid-5% range. What about uh, home prices? How are we doing there? As those mortgage rates rise, demand falls, and of course, that's pushed housing prices down. With the median home price in March at more than $375,000, but prices are still increasing in some parts of the country that are adding jobs. There are more homes on the market because houses are taking longer to sell, but construction on new homes fell last month. All right. Thank you, Nancy, so much. You're, you're welcome. All right, let's do the numbers. The FTSE in London is up one-tenth of a percent. Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ futures are down in the one to three-tenths percent range with the Dow future down 33 points. The yield on the 10-year Treasury is 3.524%. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Amazon Business. From small business to big enterprise and everything in between, Amazon Business helps simplify the supplies buying process. Amazon Business, your partner for smart business buying. And by the uncertain hour, investigates the privatization of welfare and how for-profit companies cash in on public benefits. Listen to the uncertain hour wherever you get your podcasts. The geostrategic rivalry between the U.S. and China touches national security and economics, and both of those are at play in a somewhat unseen arena where the two are competing under the sea, specifically undersea cables that sit on the ocean floor and digitally connect continents. Reuters published an extensive report on how the U.S. and China are facing off over who should build these cables and where they should connect to land. The cables cost upwards of half a billion dollars to build, and they're financed often by groups of big tech companies, Amazon, Google, Meta, China Mobile. Per Reuters, the U.S. government intervened using the threat of sanctions to ensure some of those cables were not built by Chinese companies and did not make landfall in Hong Kong. James Kraska is a professor of international maritime law at the U.S. Naval War College and joins us to talk about why this is an area area of such intense, if unpublicized, competition. Professor Kraska, thanks for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Can you just remind us why undersea Internet cables are so important to the global economy and basically modern life in general? Uh, Yes, absolutely. These are the backbone for the global information system, the global information network and they carry about 99 percent of all our telecommunications because satellite doesn't have the bandwidth and it costs too much and so almost all of our communications and this includes uh, banking transactions all of our internet activities go via submarine cables and because it's a globalized world and the economy is interconnected these have never been more important Well, so if there was some sort of international conflict or or something, are are there rules that protect these cables? Very minimal rules. The rules were developed during the era of copper cables, 
and they only pertain to connecting bilateral cables, connecting one country to another country. And the problem today is that submarine cables are fiber optic. They are constructed through a consortia of companies, and these consortia will sublease part of their bandwidth to even other companies. And so there's no such thing really as a bilateral submarine cable that's used by civilians today. Furthermore, all of these cables have both civilian traffic as well as military traffic because the military traffic is encrypted, but it still goes on the same cables that we use every day for our internet. Are these cables protected somehow? I mean, if there was a conflict, say, between the U.S. and China, what would it mean if they weren't protected? There's just not a lot of black letter law that applies, except that in armed conflict, military objectives are, are lawful, maybe lawful military targets. So any sort of uh, attack or disruption on them has to be weighed against uh, distinction. Are you able to distinguish between a military target and a civilian target? And in this case, it's sort of a dual use uh, item. Uh, dual use infrastructure, and then proportionality. Even if it is a military target, is your attack disproportionate? And these are questions that have not been answered because we've you know, not, not had uh, much experience with cutting cables during armed conflict uh, in the present day. Yeah, it sounds like this is a, a major vulnerability. It is a major vulnerability. But if you think of a country, for example, like China, that's also much more connected to the globalized economy, any type of disruption could have uh, reverberate follow-on effects. And so it's one of these measures that might have just as much blowback effect on the country cutting the cable as it does on the country that, uh, that's supposed to be you know, targeted. James Kraska is chair of the Stockton Center for International Law at the U.S. Naval War College, where he teaches about international maritime law. Professor Kraska, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Our executive producer is Kelly Silvera. Our digital producer is Jarrett Dang. Our engineers are Jessen Dooler and Nick Esposito. And in New York, I'm Sabri Beneshore with the Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media.